Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the special honor uh, for me as ambassador of Albania to participate in this event dedicated to Chile as a family. Special thanks to UCAP and the Institute of the Protestant and Opinion Studies, as well as Regent University as the organizer of this event. The Chiriazi family, especially the fabulous four, named Gerasim, Sebasti, Jerz, and Barashini, have played a very important role during the most difficult moment of Albanian history. The most prominent of them, Barashini Chiriazi, was a concrete model of strength, wisdom, courage, and dedication for the Albanian cause. Gerasim, together with his sister Sebastian Parashevi, opened the first Albanian school for girls in 1891. In 1908, Parashevi was the only woman in the Monastery Congress which adopted the Albanian Latin alphabet. She was the founder and the main contributor of the magazine Build Majesty. The magazine was published fortnight and cons consisted in Albanian related articles including politics, history, philology, literature, and folklore. During 1921-1939, the Chiriazi family was engaged in improvement of, and the modernization of a women's life in Albania. Arashevi stood as a firm anti-fascist during the Second World War, and for her anti-fascist view, she and her sister were imprisoned and deported in the Dinia prison in Belgrade. What interests us tonight is the opportunity to hear one of the world's Chiriazi scholars as Mr. David Hosfield. Thank you very much, Mr. Hosfield, for being with us today and share some of your findings regarding this brilliant Albanian family. It's never enough in f to say in football match or other events that we are proud to be Albanian, but we shall but we shall feel proud of Albanian every moment of our life because of our values, our history, our heroes, and I'm sure that tonight David will bring some more proofs to what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Chirko, for that introduction. And I read in your biography that you're a man of sports, so I wasn't surprised that there would be a sports reference tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate that because I also love sports and I appreciate the way he mentioned that because I find the Albanians very patriotic when it comes to something like uh, cheering for uh, the Kuchezi, the red and black. Um, but uh, there are so many uh, reasons to be proud Albanians that are deeply rooted in Albania's history. Uh, thank you, Kristale, for the introduction, and I have so much appreciate your work uh, telling um, stories that are so important before um, discovering them is too late. And um, this is something that's very needed and Albania still needs to have a kind of a national closure for the, uh, the difficult years of, of communism. So this is incredibly important work. Thank you, uh, Maggie, for your organizing work. Uh, Maggie is uh, a friend of me and my family for many, many years, uh, all the way in the little village of Zona B in Tripoya. And, um, and now she's here and I'm so uh, glad to see all that she does with her many talents to serve the Albanian community. Uh, thank you to the UK Albanian uh, Professionals Group and all who've, who've come. I have been assigned my topic and that's often a good thing because there's so many topics that you could talk about. So when someone just gives you the topic and the title, the family that changed the course of a nation, it, uh, it makes things easier and then harder because you think about all the ways that this family did change the course 
of a nation. Um, I am, when people ask me who I am, I, I first uh, talk about how that I am a, uh, first and foremost, a, a believer. I, um, it's, it's really the core part of my identity as it was for Gerasim Chiriazi. And I, 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 I do also teach atheism in the European University of Tirana in the course of teaching uh, uh, the philosophy of religion <laughs> to master students. And I give my students a disclaimer that um, I personally don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I find the arguments and the science uh, much more convincing to believe that there is um, an architect for such wonderful architecture. Um, and I find the historical fact of the resurre resurrection compelling enough to make me a follower of Jesus. But I'm not here to preach tonight. I, it's easy for preachers to turn into you know, using every opportunity to preach, and I, I won't do that. I think Gerasim Chiriazi often did that. And one of the pictures you'll see tonight, you're going to see pictures tonight that that you haven't seen before because some of them have been seen before, but some of them I'm sure that no one's ever seen before because I took some of them and have never showed them to anyone else. Uh, but you'll see a beautiful picture of Gerasim. Uh, another part of my core identity is being a, a, a husband and father, and I'm so thankful for my family who joined me on this wonderful journey in Albania. I'd like to also um, tell the story now uh, as best I can, um, Kristaila is this wonderful storyteller, and I'll add the facts and the pictures that will support this wonderful, brief uh, story of the course of this incredible family's life. But just the cast of characters here, these are really the most known photographs of this family. So if you might go to Wikipedia or something, you'll probably find these pictures. These are widely uh, distributed. Gerasim, Sevasti, Parashivi, and Jerj. And yes, there were 10 children. Um, and so when I think of this family, I think one of the most important members of this family was this Chiriazi, Mama, the mother of 10 uh, Chiriazi children. And I don't know much about her. This obviously is a picture taken um, very early before she, uh, before she had children. And, and, and she must have been a fascinating woman. And it's so important to take our roles as, as family members very seriously, because how did the four fabulous four um, Chiriazis change the nation? It started with a really good mother who invested in her kids. And so um, you might not be able to go to a Paris peace conference like Paris Chevy did or start a girls school like Gerasim did. But if you're really working hard at home with your kids, really that's a huge, huge thing. We're talking about a time when there was no Albania in the sense of a political nation. We're talking about a family, these children who were born before Albania was born in that sense in 1912 at our independence about 108 years ago. It was a time when it was Albanian territories um, were mixed in with many other ethnicities in this area known by many names. We know it now as the Balkans. It was once called the Near East. Um, it, it, and it's a place that many historians have said in the Balkans, there's um, too much history and not enough geography. And so it's been the, 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 the place where many wars have, have started, unfortunately. And I think at the end of the Ottoman Empire, when the Ottoman Empire was weakening and receding more into its, uh, the present borders of, of Turkey, there were strong things historically going on. There were, there were events and uh, plays being made on the territory from the Balkan nations and from the great powers who had their own special interests in this beautiful part of the world. And so the Albanian territories were interesting. I think about the, con the context of the Chiriazis, infrastructure. This is a map that you can't really see all the details, but it was a map we found in 1824, which happens to be the year that the very first part of the Bible was translated into Albania. The British and Foreign Bible Society started interesting themselves in Albanian language in 1816. 
And then in 1824, the Gospel of Matthew was published. It, Albanian was not a published language at that time. Yes, there had been some things written. Um, we have Buzuku in the 16th century, but these were not books meant for mass distribution and reading. And in this time, they were not even, they hadn't been rediscovered yet. So you have Bible Society people saying there's no other book at all in Albanian because practically that was the case. And so this map is produced in that same year. And right here, you can't see it, but there's a little, there's a little key to the map. And all through this map, I'll zoom in in a moment, there are little roads, little dotted lines that indicate the kinds of roads. And in the entire map of Albania, which includes parts of today's, uh, you know, what, the borders of Greece and then up into, uh, into Montenegro, Kosovo, um, you have, and I've colored them in here, you have one main road, three cart roads, and 13 horse roads. And so that's the colors that you can see. And, and the main road isn't even in present day Albania. And so you, you can see that if you only have a few roads like that, the infrastructure is, is, quite, is quite lacking. Then um, you have the, the area of religious life in Albania. We talk a lot about Albania's unique place in the world as having so many religions and yet there's harmony among the Albanian people. It is really a model in the world, and many foreign foreigners marvel at that. Uh, it's true that many Balkan countries, they have a common religion for the large percentage of their populations. In Albania, Orthodox, Catholic, Muslim, it was a mix. But those religions didn't function in Albanian territories in the native tongue. So if you would go to a mosque, you would hear Arabic or Old Ottoman. If you would go to a church, you'd hear Greek or Latin. You wouldn't hear your, with, with, with some exceptions, but not many, very few exceptions. You would only hear a different language. And some people would quip that God doesn't speak Albanian. In this photograph taken by Marubi, you've heard of the Marubi brothers, I'm, I forget exactly which Marubi took this, was never known until a few years ago when some friend of mine who works there says, I think I found a picture of Gerasim Chiriazi. It's a fantastic photo, I love the photo. It's him with his Bible in his Albanian costume pointing to heaven, directing the attention of his people. It's his Albanian Bible. Um, he had a vision before he had a vision to do something for politically for the nation, he just had a vision that his own people would be able to know that God actually does speak Albanian. Um, this is a map of the American board. The American board was a Protestant missionary organization, the first one from the United States, and actually today is the 200th anniversary of the arrival of the first two American missionaries to the Ottoman Empire. They arrived in Izmir on this day 200 years ago. And over time, they started going west. So they went east and then they started coming west. And from Constantinople, you can see a pattern of how they opened new missionary stations. And from those missionary stations, they went and started, started new ones. They would start churches, they would start schools, and eventually, from Samokov, some missionaries came to Monastir. Today it's called Bitola in North Macedonia. And that's where um, the Chiriazi family lived. You can see how close it is to Korcha. Um, it looks closer than it actually is if you're going by one of those horse cart roads or something. It seems even further when you think about the possibility of being, being kidnapped by brigands, as we heard a moment ago. But that's where Gerasim and the whole Chiriazi family had their first context, contacts with evangelical Protestant missionaries. In fact, the family, the Jenny family that went to Monastir to start a church and school, rented a home that happened to be sharing 
one, a courtyard with the Chiriazzi family and they heard little Sevasti crying one day because she was sick and they said, what's wrong with the girl? And they gave her some medicine, she survived. And after that, the parents allowed Gerasim to go to their school. Gerasim learned um, in the school, then he started attending church. He, he, and you know, these are real people. A lot of times we hear, we read the stories about these national figures, these rilindas, and you have these very romantic sayings, ilindi ne zemer chutabunta dichka per popoli nevet, you know, it, he had this desire in his heart. No, Gerasim Chiriazi was a teenager. His first contact with the missionaries before the event with Sevasti being sick was he and his friends would throw snowballs into the meeting to disrupt the Christian meetings going on. This wasn't some guy that had some idea that, hmm, this is my way to connect with this group to get their money so that I can change the nation. He was just a teenager making trouble. But he starts reading a Bible they gave him in Greek and he reads it and he becomes a, a believer. According to the, the Protestant tradition, he becomes a believer in Jesus and he goes to study at the seminary, the theological seminary of Samakov in the writings Produced in the communist era, the words Protestant seminary were not mentioned. This was not theology, it's called the theological seminary. They censored that out. It was just the school in Samakov where he got his education. So there was a bit of burial of the facts of the story during the time of, communist, of communism, and um, there's obvious reasons for that. He would go on to preach, become start a church in, in monastery, preached his first Albanian sermon in Thessaloniki. And then he preached in monastery, started a church. And one of the things that missionaries would do wherever they would go is they would make sure that there was a Bible in the language of the people that was readable and understandable. And then they would start with their hymn books. So we have the same version of, a, of a, well, the same, the same hymn book. The first one's in 1893. This is mimeographed in Korcha. And then in 1907, it's added, it's, it's, it grows. And then again in 1927, it's, it's translated again. And we actually have this document. It is the, um, it is Parashchevi Chiriazi's translation. You can see here, it's the same song and it's Albanianized or translated by Zonia Parashchevi Chiriazi. And we have some of these original manuscripts that have come to us. That's another story. Uh, one of the key people in this movement, I think personally the foreigner that had the greatest impact on the Albanian National Awakening is Alexander Thompson. He's from Scotland. And he is assigned to be the director of the British and Foreign Bible Society for all of the Ottoman Empire. And he makes a visit to Albania and he comes back and says, I see Scotland in these hills. I, I, I have a special love for these Albanians. In fact, if you go to Istanbul to, his, uh, to, the, to the cemetery where he's buried, on his um, tombstone, his children have etched in there that he worked for the Albanians. Of all the, of all the many, many nationalities in the Ottoman Empire, they chose Albanians because he, they were close to his heart. I love this photo. He has his Bible in his hand and he was a mentor to Gerasim Chiriazi. And he was a mentor to this man. Anybody know his name? Konstantin Christophoridi. Christophoridi is the first documented Albanian Protestant. He converts to Protestantism on his own by reading theology, interestingly enough, and finds a preacher in Izmir, Smyrna, and says, I, I didn't know you guys existed. And he becomes a member, he's, he's examined uh, um, officially, and he becomes a member of that church. And he says, I want my people to be able to read the Bible because the first Bible that was printed, I told you about in 1824, people don't understand it. It had Greek letters and the people in the North especially don't want Greek letters, there's problems, you know, and so, uh, let's, let's make it a, an Albanian language, and you'll see a picture of, of what it looked like, the Albanian letters that Christopher Ridi, um did. He, Christopher Ridi is called today the father of the Albanian language, because when he translated, he made Bible translations in Toskarisht and Gegnisht, the two dialects of Albania. 
And this actually is so interesting because if you see these texts, on the back of them, they advertise the Bibles and other books that they were printing in the opposite dialect. So if you have a Geg Bible or children's storybook, Bible storybook, on the back, you have, hey, you can get a Tosk version. And as you look at, the, at, the, as you look at them, you say, you know what, even though we're north and they're south, um, the languages aren't so, the dialects aren't so different. Because I told you earlier that Albanians didn't, they didn't find a national identity through religion. The Albanians found unity through the Albanian language. Shtipia. The Albanian language makes an Albanian. And so he is rightfully called the father of the Albanian language. But Thompson really wanted him to be more of a preacher than he was. And he wasn't. And so when he found Gerasim, he found someone who was all ready to be a preacher. And so he also worked with Gerasim. Education was... Uh, lacking in Albania. Here are two books uh, written in 1902-1907. George Chiriazi compiled these books together. Crestomazzi. A Crestomazzi. A Crestomazzi is just a, a book of verses and dramas and stories. And one of them, I just want to read you from, 19, from 1902. Um, it's Gerasim writing, obviously before he died. And it's a story, it's a dialogue between two girls. We're going to republish these. And there's so many little sketches and dialogues and they'll, they'll just be fantastic for, um, for schools. And, and, and some of them are, are fantastic. But one of them goes into history a little bit. And Afrodita asks a question to Manu Shachia. And I'll read it in Albanian. shipris. <laughs> In Manu Shachia replies, Skamia mave te jithi mundon, se anem ba ne rasira in bulon, asnye ven spash ne tur gegerin, shchipen tamsoin, tanderoin shchipperin. So what they're saying is, you know, one girl's asking the other, uh, have you been to the north? And he answers, he, he replies, and she, the, the other girl replies, it's, it's, it, everything is so poor. And she's not just talking about physically poor, monetarily poor. There's no place where you can learn Albanian. That was 1908, 1902, um, written in probably 1893. That's, that's just a little, 20 years before independence. And remember when Ismail Chemali goes out on his balcony in Vlora and puts out a flag and they get together and they say, we're a nation, we're independent. Okay, so we, we I, mean, I, I woke up this morning and took a little walk uh, in, in, what's the, where's my laja? Southgate. Southgate. I saw restaurants serving tashchebab and birek. I heard Albanian, I couldn't believe it. I said, did my plane take me to Tropoya? Where am I? <laughs> yeah. So if a bunch of people in Southgate go on a balcony and say, we're declaring independence. Um, no, nobody's going to take them seriously, right? Um, there's breakaway movements all over the world. But to declare independence, you have to make sure that the world is going to take you seriously. If you don't have an alphabet, if you don't have schools, how can that happen? So there's serious problems in Albania before 1912. And the Chiriazi family will find themselves at the tip of the spear. When I say the tip of the spear, I mean they were, if you just look at all the national awakening figures, the Rilindas, how many of them actually worked for the majority of their lives inside Albania? Many of them were supporting it from the outside, and that was important, but they were on the inside. And they chose that. So I want to show you a little bit about what the Bible Society did. They didn't just print a Bible so people could put it in the dashboard of their car. Nobody had cars, but dashboard of their carots. Um, and drive around as using the Bible as a, as a religious luck charm, haimali. <clears throat> they wanted people to read it. So this photograph, which we've colored, all right, just because we can and it's fun. Um, and, <laughs> 
it, it, it's a photo from 1892. Um, this man is Jerj Chiriazi. Isn't that great? Like the Beatles must have gotten their inspiration from Jerj. <laughs> Jared Shiriazi, also taken by the, the, the Marubi brothers. <clears throat> and here is another photo of the Bible Depot. Now, if, if you've been to Shkodra, right across from the Turizmi, the big hotel, there's a, it's called the Sahati Inglizit, the Britishman's Watchtower, the Eng Englishman's Watchtower. It's really, for me, and since I have you here, it's, it's the only monument to British-Albanian uh, relations as far as a physical monument. Edith, Edith Durham and, and so many of, the, of, the, of the, these, these British citizens who took interest in Albania, that was a center for them, and Lord Paget was among them. He let the Bible Society use that. And this is just an example of one of the many book depots the Bibles were in many languages because there were many different people in the, in the area. Here you have Jerj Chiriazi. There's a map of, you know, you can see the map of the Balkan Peninsula here. This is a calendar and there's, it's a dual language calendar. So with the Ottoman calendar and the Western calendar. Back here, this is one of the book machines where they press down the books. Um, he's reading, a, this is John Siko and he's reading a Bulgarian evangelical magazine called the Zornitsa. And the Zornitsa means morning star. And you might think, Uli Imanjesit, which we'll hear a little bit about in a moment. Um, so, the, and, and then they had tables of books and they had seating. And what these Bible Society depots were, not only warehouses, but people would come in and they would have religious discussions. And they would talk to people about issues of faith. And Sevasti writes that when she was a little girl, she says, I remember well how often I puffed up, like, puffed up like a peacock when I entered the big room full of bookshelves. And she goes on in this incredible quote, and she's saying that I could brag to my friends that we Albanians too could say that we have books. I mean, can you imagine a little girl, a little Albanian girl saying that today? Like, really, it's no big deal. I can brag that I have an iPhone, but books? This was the condition that they lived in, and no girl had ever completed high school. No Albanian girl had ever completed high school. And she actually went to university. She went to the Protestant Women's College in Istanbul. Skutari, it's called. It's not Skodra. It's the Skutari, Skudari, Uskudar of, of, of Istanbul. And she went there, and, and she took her little Bible with her. It's a psalm book, a book of the Psalms. This is the lang this is the letters of Christopher Reeve. It looks nothing like we could read today, really, but you might be able to recognize this, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And, 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 and this book is in the National Library of Albania. It's still preserved today. We found it and we realized it was Sevasti's copy and she would make notes in the side of her little Bible. This one says, Ngushalime de Shpres Tamave, great comfort and hope. So she was reading these books and more and more Albanians were starting to read. Here she is with her graduating class of six. She's seated in the middle with the flowers. Sevasti Chiriazi. And just before she graduates, her brother is captured by brigands. This is this wonderful photograph of these brigands and Shaheen Matraku, who was honored as a hero. Well, he, he's actually taking Gerasim Chiriazi captured, captured for money. And that's an incredible story. I won't go, go, go into it all. There's a book written, Captured by Brigands. But it's a moment that Gerasim, in this 168-day ordeal, instead of being bitter, Instead of uh, being angry, he has a lot of time to think, and he's thinking, how can we solve this problem? That, because this wasn't just a group of eight that everybody was worried about. It wasn't just a isolated case of, you know, some family that, there was, this was a problem all over, the, all over Albania, North Macedonia. And so he's like, let's come up with a solution. And he says, you know what? I've seen these girls' schools being opened by the missionaries. What if we started girls' schools for Albanians? So that the mothers could be educated to train up their children in a different way. This is the solution to brigandry. 
that Gerasim says we need to do it. And so he, with his sister, recently graduated. They start um, the first ever school for girls. And it, it's, it's such a taboo for a girl to go to school. And they started with just a few students because no, nobody would come. It was a, it was a, you know, it was, it was a terrible thing. And, and they would be mocked. One of the first students was this little girl here. And you might more know her as Parashchevi Chiriazi. I like taking, showing pictures of people in different stages of their life. All three pictures are, this is Sevastia. We're not sure, sure who this brother is. That's Parashchevia. Here she is in her kind of, her moments of working in the Paris Peace Conference. And then she is as the final delegate who was at the Congress of Manastir and Nejmiya Hoja introduced her in 1958. And she came up, Nejmiya said, I want the only living delegate of the Congress of Manastir to come forward and to sing one more time the song that you children sang so beautifully a, a, a little while ago. And her, um, her niece has told me, I have it on video, that everyone was weeping when they heard her singing this song. That's how important it was. Well, Paris Javi would go on, and in 1904, she graduated from the same college in Istanbul, and for many years, they worked in this school. Here's one of the many photos we have of the staff. This is Sevastia and her husband, Cristo Daco. And this is Paris Javi. This is the Kennedy family. Uh, no relation to the famous American Kennedys, but they came from uh, the United States, he actually studied under a man named Woodrow Wilson, who would do a lot for Albania. And some people think that that might be some kind of a connection that led Wilson to uh, intercede for the Albanian uh, people. And this school closed, was finally closed when all of the schools were closed in Albania, but it reopened in Kamza. And uh, it became known by presidents and prime ministers and foreign leaders as um, the um, as, as, as the cradle, a, a diepi culturis, a fole comptara, a national nest. If we go back to a congress called the Congress of Manastir, I just want to tell you more about the impact of this family. And we're going to talk about Jerj a little bit. Um, this is Jerj Chiriazi in this great group of people, some of the hundreds of delegates who came to the Congress of Monastir. And for those of you who don't know what this was, in 1908, people had started to publish. They had realized that without having our language written down, our push for autonomy, our push for independence, if it ever comes to that, will not be taken seriously. Um, to have a government, you must have writings. And there were six or seven alphabets now being used and everybody kind of wanted their alphabet to be the best one. We, we do the same thing today. I've heard that there's like four or five attempts for a Skanderbeg film. And if you just pull the money together, you can, and nobody's gonna have enough money to do it right. But if you pull all the money together, then maybe you could do a really good one that would be Hollywood worthy. Well, the same thing with a language. Well, not quite the same thing, but it's kind of an analogy. Um, there, was, there were six, um, alphabets being used and how can they have schools? How can they have something like a constitution without getting together and saying, let's choose one. And from night, from the year 1901, that's seven years before the Congress, we have indications that Jared Chiriazi is promoting this. And then we have a very clear article that he writes in a book, in, in a newspaper in 1905, and here's another great photograph of Jerj, a little bit older, and he writes in the Albania, and I won't read the entire thing, but he, he says, look, I have many books that are ready to go to press, and I can put them in, press, in print, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna wait until we can so solve this once and for all. And this is a sacrifice for me because publishing a book was important. I mean, it was hard to make money and it was a way to make money. And, but he says, we must come together. And he, he gives this beautiful, you can find it in my book if you want the full quote. He gives a beautiful apologetic for coming together to do it. And he actually becomes the organizer. I have here the most recent work by Jevat Loshi, who is an incredible Albanian linguist. 
Um, he's in his 80s and still going strong. And he's just finished a two volume work on Jerge Chiriazzi full of documents. So look, I mean, these are full of original documents that he's translated. This is the kind of material, the kind of volume of material that we're uncovering and people talk in Albania a lot, there's a debate about should we rewrite history? And we're just saying, just reread what's already there. <laughs> and that's important to start. It's Jevat Loshi's opinion that after all of the documentation that it was Jerj Chiriazi who made this conference. Without him, it would not have been done. He worked behind the scenes. He didn't want the spotlight but he was the one who did all of the work for so many times in Monastir. Somebody says, why didn't why did, why did, why did they choose Monastir? Well, um, it was such an important city and who would, who would come to London or who, how could they all come? So it was the most practical way for all the Albanians to come together and the, the small commission, you've heard of the, you know, the, the commission of, of 11 who met together, they met in Jared Chiriazzi's house and they locked themselves together in a room. This smaller group was chosen by the big group of delegates to say, all right, we want you 11 to go in Fight it out <laughs> um, as amic amicably as you can and come up with one solution. And oh, by the way, we always talk about 11, but there was one other person in that room with them and her official role was to serve the coffee, but she did a lot more than that. I can promise you that. Parashjevi was there and she was a crackerjack. <laughs> she was fireball and she had strong opinions about what should be done and they finally did choose the alphabet. Right away, the Young Turk Party began to um, fight against the language that they chose. So there was a verse in the song that you sang. It talks about, we don't want those other letters. We've got our own letters because they attempted to get, they actually paid a lot of villagers to come together to say, no, we want, um, we want Arabic script and they had to sign their names. They had no idea how to sign their names, many of them. They had no idea what they were, they just knew they were being paid. So that's when she writes in this, actually in this document that I've just kind of put as a background, but I have the whole thing. She says, when they did that, I was so angry that I wrote, how did she express her anger? How did, how did she decide to fight against this, this, um, attempt to undo what her brother had spent the last 10 years trying to do. And all of the Albanians had worked together and finally come to, you know, it's hard for Albanians to agree on something, but they finally did. And so she's, how does she fight? She fights by writing a song. I mean, what? So she writes a song. So Okay. So, and guess what? Do you know where the music comes from? I couldn't believe this. You know now? Okay, so, well, it's, on Wikipedia it says it comes from a French march. I was walking through Atlanta airport one day, there was a bowl game playing about a year and a half, two years ago, I don't know, and I heard a familiar tune. I didn't know, you know what it was. I said, well, I've heard that somewhere. You know that? I, where have I heard that? Where have I heard that? get up into the sky and some somewhere at 10,000 feet, I went, oh, that was the Albanian, that was the alphabet song. And, but then I didn't know who, what team had been playing it, the, the band that plays the game before the football game. And then I later realized it's the Oklahoma City Boomer Sooner song. Boomer Sooner, Boomer Sooner, but then they got it from Yale University. It was originally written for a Yale football match against Harvard. And when she was at school in Constantinople, they had American teachers and to boost school spirit, I'm sure she heard it. And that song was still rattling in her head in 1908, 1909. And she says, I'm gonna put my words to this tune. <laughs> and everybody will remember it because we can remember things that we sing sometimes more than the things we just memorize. So then she says everyone all over Albania was singing the alphabet song. And that's why I think that many children probably know the alphabet song more than they know Albania's national anthem. It's so catchy. 
and it's so important to Albania's spirit. She would later start a, a society for women called the Uli Mengesit. She was arrested for it. Then she would go to the United States. Many of you are, are uh, part of the diaspora, and there's so much important work that can be done for your nation as part of the diaspora. From 1917 to 1920, she, she puts out uh, 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 Uli Mengesi, it's the English Albanian uh, uh, newspaper. And it, it's, it's fascinating. It's, we're gonna try to reprint it it's at some point. <laughs> Wonderful things in there. Meanwhile, in 1919, we have the end of World War I and the Paris Peace Conference. And President Wilson is there and nine months in Paris, uh, her brother-in-law, Christo Daco goes, and he is just, he doesn't go, but he finishes a book called Albania, the Master Key to the Near East. Um, he, he's writing for an audience of President Wilson, although President Wilson probably never read the whole thing, but the very title, the Master Key to the Near East, they knew that the Near East, the Balkans, was one of the thorniest issues that they would have to resolve. And so by writing at least the title, the Master Key to the Near East, it was like, the, the basic idea was, do not carve Albania up. You'll do so at the world's peril. You must protect our territorial integrity. And he goes through a long history to, do, to give that message. The books arrive in Paris, and Paris Chevy Chiriazi delivers one personally, not to Wilson himself, but to Wilson's secretary. So we know that she gives one to Wilson. We have this dark slide just to talk about for the final moments, how that this incredible family, and I just scratched the surface, what they've done, how they've been for the Albanian nation, how they've changed. As has been mentioned, during communism, they had it rough. Both of her children were imprisoned. Here's Sevasti Chiriazi with her two children. This one allegedly committed suicide in prison. His body was never found. Actually, Sevasti did find his body one early morning in the dark as she was digging through the mud at the place where criminals were tossed. She found him, then someone was coming. She had to leave for fear that she would get caught. The next day, his body had been removed and taken somewhere else. She died a few weeks later from a broken heart. The first lady to get a college education the founder of the women's school for girls, the, the women's school, the Albanian school for girls. Her story was told in 1979 in a film called Mason Toria, very beloved film for the Albanians. The hero of the story is Sevasti Chiriazi, but even though other historical figures have their names, their real names, they give a fake name to Sevasti Chiriazi for whatever reason, Dafina. It's Sevasti Chiriazi. Recently, I tried to find her grave and didn't find this. I actually found their graves and the headstone had been removed. It was underneath a bunch of rocks and we had no idea where it was and we finally discovered it. Now it's been redone, but What's interesting is to see that finally we're uncovering some of the, some of the truth. And then where's Jerasim? Where's Jerj? Where are they buried? Well, in Korcha, this is the Vlak Orthodox Church, and this is Bar Omega. Bar Omega sits on the top of what used to be the Protestant cemetery. He fought for, with the Ottoman authorities for a long time to get a Protestant cemetery because when their people died, they weren't being accepted in the Orthodox graves or in the Muslim graves. So he fought for their rights and finally they were given permission to have a Protestant grave, but then the Vlach Orthodox community didn't have a place to bury their people either, so they said, can we share your cemetery? They did. Mm -hmm. During communism, um, Slowly it was sort of, the stones were moved and then after communism, the plot was sold and 
the guard, oops, the guard at this church told me, yeah, I remember when they were digging with their backhoes and they were finding all sorts of skulls and bones and they just leveled it and, and now you can go and dance at the disco um, over, I don't think they know, I think they'd be a little freaked out if they knew they were dancing <laughs> over the cemetery, but it is a true story. Gerasim wasn't buried there though, he was buried in Monastir. This is, this is the condition of the place when I found it. Um, it was buried outside of the main area of Bitola, and Bitola now isn't, very few Albanians are there, and those who are have, because of the Serb invasion of Bitola, they, they had to assimilate to survive. And so there were some graves here that had Albanian writing on them. And they were Albanians and they were Protestants. So in Orthodox Serbian Bitola, those were two bad things. So over the years, who knows what happened, but the Methodist church from Strumica told me one day about a year ago, we found them. We found them in a terrible condition and we have rescued them. And now nobody has seen this except the people in Strumica that didn't even know Albanian. They have gathered all the bones they could find, which were all mixed together in a mess, and they just put them in one mass grave and put the headstones of uh, the remaining pieces of the headstones back together. And so this is Gerasim's headstone. The pieces of it that are left, at least. Ktu, Chlodet, Ipari, Lechitas, Ishipris. Here rests the first preacher of Albania, Gerasim Chiriazi, the date of his birth and death, and a Bible verse that reads, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. This is a great moment in Albanian historiog historiography to put the pieces back together and to learn again that even though things might almost be lost forever, they're not actually lost forever. And there's so many stories that encourage us and inspire us and inspire us to do more for our nation, to do more for our neighbor, even if it means that we sacrifice like the Albanian Chiriazi family did. Thank you so much for your attention. It was a pleasure to share these things.